My name is Emily. I'm your City Council President. I'm a Commissioner in the Duluth Economic Development Authority. And I'm running for mayor because I have a vision for Duluth that is about building on the momentum that we have created in the last five, ten years, the economic growth um, and the progress we're seeing, the way Duluth is seen across the state in a very different and positive way. Um, but I'm also running because I'm concerned that there are people who are going to be left behind in our next chapter if we're not very careful. And what I mean by that is that there are a few neighborhoods that struggle quite a bit economically. There are people and families right now who don't feel a part of the vision for Duluth and what's happening. And I have priorities to bring people together and to have an inclusive leadership. I envision doing that by uh, prioritizing our city policies to ensure that they are focused on people's everyday experiences, that people can rely on city government for things like water and roads and infrastructure, but also uh, the day-to-day -day experiences that they need to have and that the city provides them. I envision our economic development continuing in a trajectory that we're on, but also um, building an economy that works for everyone while we do that. And, and what I mean is that we're doing economic development while protecting our unique neighborhoods. We're doing economic development while ensuring that when we give public dollars to private businesses, we are ensuring that those are gonna be good jobs, that those businesses are going to be staying here for the long term, and that we have some accountability measures in place. And I'm running because I actually do believe that some of the quality of life things that we provide, like parks and libraries, are really important. And these are the things that create home for people in that experience. So that's some of why I'm running. And I'm sure you'll ask more questions about yeah, that. We definitely have the issues yep. we want to hit on. But no, that's great. But what would you see as your top issue? Uh, my top issue is housing and its infrastructure. Okay. And it's I have three top issues, housing, infrastructure, and um, inequity in our community. Uh, inequity between our neighborhoods, inequity okay. between people. In inequity, is that what you kind of were getting at when you said that you want to build an economy that works for everyone? Yep, that's exactly The other right. two issues we have on our list, so we'll get to those. Talk Great, about the inequity it. first. Well, what I find is that there are people who are not a part of the conversation about city government right now. There are neighborhoods of people, and I'm out door knocking. I don't think I'm sharing anything new with anyone here. I'm out door knocking. There are a lot of people who say, I don't feel a part of this government. I don't feel a part of what's happening. Um, and so again, that building economy is that large scale vision that brings people along that when we do investments like Pier B or we do investments like Bluestone or we do investments like Cirrus, these are really, really important businesses that we have and what we need to ensure is that these businesses stay here, they're providing good jobs, we're creating a pipeline for people, mm -hmm. we're creating pathways to employment within those sectors, we're working with DEED, we're working with, with our workforce development dollars, and we're bringing people along so that those investments yield the best results. Okay. I'm actually a little surprised to hear about a disconnect, but that's what you're hearing door to door. That's what I'm hearing door to door. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Talk about what you envision as your, your style. I mean, obviously you're continuing uh, a lot of what Mayor Don Ness has done, but do you see yourself as just kind of continuing his administration or are you something new and different? I'm something new and both? different. Well, there, I mean, there's a mixture, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a lot. This mayor, whoever it is, in November and in January is going to inherit, I think for the first time in many changes of administration, a very firm financial footing on the city. And I think there have been some decisions made that are really important to continue. I have a very, very different style than our current administration. I tend to be much more collaborative. I like to bring people into a conversation. Um, so the style that we bring is very different. Some of what I've done on city council in terms of supporting transparency, bringing web streaming live, doing closed captioning. Um, I want as many people involved as in city government as possible. and. I think that makes decisions better. I always seek people's opinions, especially when they differ from mine. And uh, so we have a very different style. I tend to be much more hands-on and okay. uh, much more collaborative. Talk about 
Styler, how you'd be the same or different with regard to economic development? You mentioned you're on DITA. Yeah. You know, what, what should we be doing more to bring in industry business here? You know, the other mayoral candidates we talked about have all mentioned that. Good. That's great. I'm yeah. really glad. So we have some industry sectors that do really well. Tourism's doing very well, and, and we're well served by that. I'd like to see us do much more when it comes to manufacturing. And some of what we can do there is we have these big swaths of land. We don't have a lot of them. Duluth is landlocked. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we need to really carefully package what we have there. We have the Atlas Industrial Site. Um, we have a lot of investment coming in from DEED and from our partners there to, you know, do work in high demand sectors and so kind of aligning those. Um, so I'm really passionate about that and, and part of what we need to do is make it, you know, part of what economic development is when you're a city is you need to be a really reliable, stable partner. So when I've done um, interviews and one-on-ones with business owners over the course of this campaign I announced in December so I've been working right. really hard since then what I hear over and over again is I want to know that I can rely on the city I want to know that the person who tells me what I need to do that that's an accurate pathway to that I I get frustrated when I bring my packet in and I'm told now I've got to do this next thing so there's right. there's some of what we do is provide connections and reliability some of what we do is work with our county and state and tribal partners to further economic development and so the city is actually in a lot of ways kind of that broker we set the narrative yeah. we work hard and aggressively we can work with developers we can recruit them a lot of what we do then is broker and provide reliability. People want to know that our economic developer understands the landscape, they have the tools, they know what the city council and what DITA is going to be asking for so that they can say mm -hmm. to their business and their developers, here's what I think we're going to need to do and here's where I think this is going to be successful. Chuck, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, Emily, would you be targeting <clears throat> that, you know, certain types of businesses? For instance, we've had people in here talk about tech, or computers mm -hmm. or others. You know, one even talked about an auto manufacturing. Oh, that's great. Is, is there yeah. anything that you would be looking at that you feel Duluth fits well with? I mean, some things obviously won't work here. So. Mm -hmm. Some things, so <clears throat> what I'd like to do is kind of build that trajectory. So we've done that a little bit with aviation, right? So we have some aviation uh, specialties and then we have some industries that build into the Cirrus and the AAR. Um, we have uh, different manufacturing. When it, so I, I mean, manufacturing is is really where I see a lot happening and that's partly because it is a pathway career and it is a pathway business. It can serve the industrial sewers, it can serve the welders, it can serve those kind of conventional manufacturers. So that's actually what I'd like to see us do much more of. Okay, thank you. Emma, could you go back and talk a little bit more about your, your background, your experiences mm -hmm. as they relate to, to you know, what's relevant to being a mayor? Uh, other than being a city councilor and a, and a DITA member as a city councilor. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So I actually think all experience is relevant to being mayor. I mean, we all have life experience that you bring into your day job, and it's, right. it's very much the same uh, for a mayor. So, you know, I'd love to tell you a little bit. Actually, what my first uh, time in Duluth, I was born in St. Paul. My very first visit in Duluth, I was five years old, and it was the only family vacation we ever took. I talk a little bit about this in the op-ed, and so That's you may right. have seen that there. Um, and I fell, I totally fell in love with Duluth uh, immediately, and uh, that was a, a reflection on what was happening in my own family at that time and how I felt uh, being here. But when I got a chance to choose a home for myself, I chose Duluth. So the first chance I got, I came on scholarship to St. Scholastica, and then I just stayed. There was. There was no leaving. I, I really, really love living here. It's I've been here 24 years, been here longer than I haven't, actually. So uh, I think like many, many people, uh, Duluth is home and it's a it's a home that I've chosen. Sure, and it's a home sure. that I feel like actually chose me, too. Yeah, yeah. So I, I bring that experience that I think a lot of people really understand and resonate with and share. Uh, my first job out of college was with CHUM, Churches United in Ministry, working with families who are homeless and families at risk of homelessness. I spent 12 years working at the drop-in center, working with families to ensure uh, pathways to education, to housing, to work. <clears throat> did community organizing there around issues that help people be economically sustainable. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you kind of get to that point where you feel like, okay, I'm doing the Band-Aid work, but I, I really want to work on issues. All the way along, I'd work on different political issues and different campaigns, but what I found is that I really wanted to work on community development issues. And I went back to school, I got my master's degree at UMD, and this was at a time when we had real, real young kids. 
At the same time, my husband and I opened a business, Wagner's on Architecture, and so for a few years it was um, very busy and very chaotic and very, uh, we were broke and it was a, a great time in our lives. Um, but I got my master's degree and started doing work, uh, that broad-based community development work. I now own a consulting business. I work with LISC, I work with CHUM, I work with SOAR, uh, I've worked with the United Way. So I have a list of clients that I work with and my job is to help these organizations be more effective, be more sustainable. So that's part of what I bring to my professional experience here. Thank you. What's what is it for? What is the name of your consulting business, and what specifically do you consult on? Yeah, Emily Larson Consulting. Okay. I'm a sole proprietor, okay. and I have my own office, and I consult with nonprofits in ways that help them be more effective. So, sure. you know, I I coordinate a program called Duluth at Work for Duluth LISC. I've mm -hmm. done a specific strategic uh, facilitation and meeting and board development. I've done fundraising, so I kind of have right. a portfolio of things that I do. Okay. That would, would that kind of take a backseat a little bit if you're elected mayor? Because oh, I would close that down. I mean, I yeah. you know I'm tapering. I mean, as yeah. you know, when and you know some people here have run before. This is your job. Yeah. My job right now yeah. is to learn. It's to communicate. It's to be effective. And so okay. I've tapered that down a bit. And then of course I would close that altogether. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's talk about some of the the issues that we have <laughs> on our list. You brought up housing, uh, so we'll start with that. Of course, the need for both affordable yep. and workforce housing. Uh, how are we doing, and what should we be doing more of? Or? Well, we have studies that show us all sorts of things, um, but. Uh, you know, the reality is we need a depth of housing that we don't really have right now. I mean, I feel like, again, we have some landlocked issues. So the, in my mind, um, we don't have quite as much land development opportunity for new housing. We do have some and we need to pursue that and we need to prioritize that. Uh, I see some of our biggest opportunities within infill housing, working within neighborhoods that we have. Um, we have an incredibly old housing stock, we know that. I would like to work with our partners and our state partners to identify energy efficiency options with, with some of that old housing to help ensure that as people are transitioning from being first-time homeowners to second-time homeowners, that people who are inheriting that first-time home, they can maybe buy into it at that price point. And we have some neighborhoods where this is happening. They can buy into it, but they cannot uh, do the home remodeling, cannot afford um, you know some of some of those things outside of energy efficiency mm -hmm. but some of those basic things I see a role of government in ensuring that there is a portfolio of housing and that people you know have an opportunity to choose from every neighborhood that every neighborhood feels like ones that you want to live in you mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. the housing stock feels good that people feel safe that you have um, you know reliable neighbors around you so some of its you know, physically the housing stock, some of it is how do you talk about our housing stock, some of it is what tools are we giving our homeowners, and then how are we marketing to developers. And what I'm finding when I'm talking with developers is that, um, you know, there's an experiment in town now with some of this commercial housing, Bluestone, right. Harbor Bay. Right. These are new developments for us, and we haven't always seen developers want to take that chance on Duluth. Yeah. Um, I'm really hopeful about that and I'd also like to see us build more density downtown. I think there is a shift of people who are more interested in living downtown than before. So what type of tools do you see the city offering families who want to move into say example the uh, older homes? Yeah. Um, there's, there's funding in that for energy efficiency but you mm -hmm. mentioned going beyond that so mm -hmm. how would the how would the city support families in that way? What yeah. are the tools? Well, some of, yep, and we have partners in town. So some of what we do is we can work with large scale developers, like I'm sure you know, we have tools like ta uh, tax yep. abatement or TIF and you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, that's not really for the individual homeowner. Mm -hmm. So I believe what we can do, we have funding that we have through CDBG and these can go to different programs that work directly with homeowners, community development block grants. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is income limited. So if you live within a certain income, you can access funds through programs there and then we have this kind of middle middle gap. Right. Some of the partners that I'm working with, including Eco3, Ecolibrium3 and others, um, we have this uh, disaster res resiliency community grant coming up. There's a couple things we can put together that people are talking about bringing millions and millions of dollars into the community to ensure that our neighborhoods are resilient. And so some of what the city does in that is we help broker those grants, we help deliver those grants, we help contract for those grants. And I'm, I'm not sure if you have heard a whole lot about the disaster resiliency process that's underway, but uh, Duluth is poised to receive about $40 million in funding. Um, that can be used for a variety of things and some of that will include housing. Um, you, you mentioned briefly the 
the apartment, the, the what I would consider higher end yeah. apartments, and it looks to me it's about 400 units are going to go up. Do you have any perception how much of that is going to be absorbed by people that are already here, and how many houses is that? that and how many houses that frees up? Frees up, isn't that? The right? I think that's the perception that that will happen, and I think partly what I think might happen, John. I think that I think some people will move up into that, and that and then other housing will be created. But I actually think housing like that might like really appeal to some people moving into Duluth and provide that kind of final piece that people are looking for as they're looking for a home. So I don't know the number of how those, I don't, I don't know the number of how many people are expected to shift in and create here. I know there's the anticipation of that, but I don't know the percentage. Okay, and that was it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, m moving on, uh, relations between the Fond du Lac Band yeah. and, and the city of Duluth uh, in light of the, the casino profit sharing and mm -hmm. everything that's happening. I don't have to go into a lot of detail, but how can we improve that, mend that? Is there is there work that needs to be done on that? Oh, there's so much yeah. work that needs to be done on that, and that's actually one of the areas that I'm really looking forward to working on. So obviously we have this ongoing litigation, it, and that's a, that's a difficult thing for... Um, for a lot of people, as a city council president, um, it's a difficult issue because I can't put our litigation at risk. Um, but I will say that um, I do see that there is enormous opportunity for us to find ways that can work better for the people we have in common. I do think that working with the Fond du Lac Band is, is like working with our other government partners, the county, the state. Um, however, they're a sovereign nation, and uh, they have tools and opportunities that we need to respect, and I think that we have um, in some ways missed the opportunity to uh, work with them as equals in ways that could financially benefit. And so as this litigation kind of moves forward, what I'm hoping happens is that we resolve that soon. I actually don't see... Um, I don't see that litigation happening in a way that's going to financially benefit Duluth as it has in the past. Okay. And I think that um, that soon will be the time to come back to a negotiation and I know that, that there has been efforts at that. Yeah. What's clear to me is that the current configuration, nothing is going to be different with this current configuration. And I think it's a mistake to say something as simple as, oh, you bring a new mayor in and it's all going to be different. This is a negotiation. Mm -hmm. And it needs to start from an understanding of that and a respect for that process. Um, however, bringing in a new perspective is something that I think is going to benefit. Yeah. And what I can say, while uh, Chairperson Diver and I have not communicated directly because of litigation and because, okay. um, because I think that that's an important piece that has to happen on its own, um, uh, we do have several people in common, and I am very confident. I would not say they broker. I would not say that there's a closeness there. I am very confident that there is a way that we can um, identify what a potential settlement could look like and what other benefits of a partnership can be for our downtown okay. and for the people we have in common. Sure. People, and again, at the doors when I am door knocking, citywide, people have a lot of opinions. It's one of the first things I get asked. About the, the yes, yeah. which is wonderful, and what I hear from people <clears throat> is an exhaustion for the topic. It it um, culturally is doesn't feel good for a lot of folks, right. um, and financially, we're investing in a litigation that isn't yielding for us at this point. So it's been really interesting to door knock and hear that issue because that is there's a consensus building around that. Right. Yeah, no, when you door knock, do you just kind of ask people what, you know, what's on your mind, or do you, you bring up subjects yeah, both, to them? Both. Or, yeah, both, yeah, yeah. It's my favorite part of campaigning, actually, door knocking. And <laughs> once you've done it, you know why. It's really great to talk to people at their door. You mentioned early, uh, that the city, earlier that the city is in very firm financial footing right now, and yet streets remain yeah. you know, a difficult thing to, to finance or to fund. Uh, they're a mess. Uh, how can we do a better job of keeping up on the, the repairs and those core services? Yep. So that's the other thing people love to talk about at their door. And I mean, seriously, our streets need work. Yep. Yeah. There is there is no doubt about it. Now you can, you can talk about. We live in a climate. These are the expectations. I get it. I get it. We need to fix the streets. And you know, everyone, every candidate's going to talk about that. I know this budget. I can tell you that we can find some money. But okay. to talk about being able to find the millions of dollars we need, it's not going to happen in this budget. So. Um, 
two things that I think we need to do. We, we you know, the St. Louis County just did pass a sales tax for which they are now going to be contributing to our roads. We need to ensure that we're working really closely with our county partners that we're reaping the benefit of that tax. Um, also, we need to be working with our state. You know, the legislature this year, or this last year, was slated to talk about transportation and didn't, didn't right. get to that. Uh, our federal partners, the reality is Duluth is not alone in this. It's right. really visible and it's, I mean, I get it. So I think, and the other thing I'd like, I'd really like to do, and it's not going to happen this year, um, but one of the things that I would really like to do as mayor is to hear what people want to you know, we have this really ungratifying $5 street fee. It, mm -hmm. it, it's not enough to get stuff done. And but, that's but one of the reasons why it's ungratifying. Yeah. And, it's, and it ticks everyone off. I yeah. get it. Yeah. I actually get it. I understand. I don't like it either. Right. So I actually think what the conversation we have had in the past about streets has come out of City Hall. And what I'd like to see is the conversation of streets come out from the community. And what I mean by that is, what do people want to pay? What are people willing to give up? Because what I hear, actually, um, I do hear a lot of people kind of sound bite streets into saying, well, our priority has to be only these few things and only these mm -hmm. few things. I actually believe the public is not interested in prioritizing streets to the detriment of many, many other things. Right. And what I think we need to do is open that budget up have people take a look at where where is money being spent, shift what we can, because I actually do think we can probably find a few hundred thousand dollars, I mm -hmm. do. But to say that we can find two, six, eight mm -hmm. million isn't, isn't realistic. And part of what I'd like to see is, um, you know, over the course of time, we can talk about that $5 street fee, and we can talk about every year we have to, as the council either has to continue it or do away with it or raise it. Um, we can talk about rolling that into a property tax, which is more equitable. We can talk about not having that fee at all. We can talk about cutting services. The feedback I'm getting at the door is that people want their streets fixed, but they don't want to cut services. Mm -hmm. so, so then the conversation needs to be, what, what do you want to do? What, what is your appetite for investing in this? If at the same time we're working with our county partners, we're working with our state and federal government and getting everything we can there, because the reality is, cities and citizens and residents are absorbing the disinvestment on mm -hmm. state and federal level. That's the reality. Doesn't change where we're at, but yeah. that's the reality. Don't you hear that people, most people feel like I'm already paying enough in taxes. It should be yeah. enough to already cover it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. the hunger to pay more, you're probably not. No, paying. I mean, I agree with you yeah. on that, but I think, I think the frustration is in part because people haven't been included in the discussion. Okay. And so what you hear is this kind of sound bite that can come out of government, right? Well, Let's open it up. Let's mm -hmm. open up the budget. Let me show you what we have. Let me show you what I can move. Let me show mm -hmm. you we have different because some of that has to be about you can't use tourism tax for roads. Right. You can't use these other dedicated funds for roads. That's fine, but let's mm -hmm. make sure everyone has that information so yeah. that you know what's at risk if we're rebalancing. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of uh, confusion about how the money works. And, and how, how would you have that conversation in the communities? Would you? Bring back the uh, the community, you know, there were the little planning districts. Yes, I was thinking about that. Mm -hmm. The neighborhood planning districts, yes, I was actually mm -hmm. thinking about that. Um, I also think, you know, you can have different kind of public forums where it's really about let's, so everyone needs information differently. So we have to find different ways to do it. You know, you can do some online tools, you can do some public meetings, but I was actually thinking about those neighborhood planning groups, Becky, because they were really popular in the sense that they drove turnout, people were engaged, um, and that was in part, I think, helped inform the comprehensive plan and other mm -hmm. things. But to yeah. me, that's a, that's a, people feel really comfortable talking in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They feel they less comfortable advantage. coming into city hall. And our job as government is to be out in the neighborhoods. A library. Yeah. You know all the background on it. The, I've got what, some. What should I've got happen? Some. Um, well, I don't think anything should happen on the library till we figure out streets. And okay. the thing that um, that got to that for me was when that when we when it became clear in the last um, piece of litigation with the Fond du Lac, and Fond du Lac is not responsible for our library. Fond du Lac is not responsible for our streets, but at this point we have a litigation where there is an enormous amount of money tied in and we have to be mindful of that. So I'm not putting the blame on, on that. Um, but for me, when I saw that that litigation of back pay, um, what I call back pay, was not going to turn in our favor at right. this time, it felt like, you know what, layering that with another um, 
another piece of how else we're going to spend money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is we got to work on streets. Let's figure that out first. Right. Uh, I would, okay. I do feel really passionately that that library, our library system needs to function better and, you know, efficiently for sure when you're talking about the energy that we're losing, but right. also, um, you know, staff has concerns about sight lines. Staff has concerns about safety. Staff has concerns. Consumers have concerns that I can't use computer banks and this mm -hmm. is the way that I job search. Right. We have to do something there. If it's there, that's fine. If, and if the push we get from the community is that we don't want a new building, that's fine. Um, I also think uh, that we should be looking, and I've said this before, our branch libraries, you know, and enhancing right. the services yeah. there. Um, and while we do that, one of the things that I'd like to see in the whole library conversation is expanded hours. And expanding our hours, you know, it's about thirty to $60,000 a year, depending on, on the hours and factors you're looking at. That's a conversation we have to have with our contracts. You know, we have staff under contract. And so it's not something you can as easily say, we're just going to put the money in here. Some of those investments, though, uh, we can do <coughs> while... An investment in our staffing at the downtown library is going to yield a really good result while we work on streets, while we do other things. Right. You have to kind of do it at the same time, and the bang for your buck on that level of investment is much bigger right now than it will be on a community conversation about a $35 million library. Okay. Uh, bonding priority next session, mm -hmm. what do you see? Uh, I just was talking with our legislators last night about this, actually. So we have a few Great things. Timing. I know it. It's funny too, actually. Uh, so we have a few things underway that you know what I first see the first six months of any administration, I think, is getting the lay of the land and mm -hmm. uh, bringing staff into your vision and working with legislators to see what they need. So it is going to be a bonding session. Um, and so I'd like to see us. I was talking actually with a uh, representative last night about housing and seeing what we could include in housing. Some of some of the vision towards that has to happen over a couple of year cycle. Uh, yeah. I think it would be a mistake for uh, a new mayor to take us completely off course from what we've been doing because our legislators are kind of set up and prepared and have been creating a pathway. So some of the conversation on bonding has to be about visioning out a few years and yeah. where we want that to go. Um, but I would like to see that. I think there is discussion about the zoo and okay, what good. to do with the zoo. Um, so there's you know several kind of active issues that are underway right now already and I would seek to continue to support the direction that our bonding is going. We've been very, very successful um, with our legislature, we have a really good standing across the state. What is your vision for the zoo? I was kind of surprised by some of the current visions mm -hmm. that were. Okay, okay, here's my vision of the zoo. Okay. Um, it's a huge community asset. I actually support a zoo that has animals. I think that a zoo, um, and we need to find a way Right now, we, we give a lot of money to the zoo, like we do many attractions. Um, and so we have to find a way to make sure that we're getting kind of the bang for our buck there, just like we do with everything else. People love the zoo. And I think it's important that we continue to have a zoo that has animals. I would like to see some year-round pieces there. I'd love to see an indoor playground. And the work <coughs> that I'm hearing, um, or the work that I'm doing and what I'm hearing from people is they want to see more year-round components at the zoo. Um, I support animals at the zoo. I think we need to think about the cost of the animals that we have and if we want to continue um, with some of the large-scale animal exhibits or not. I'd like to increase the education that we're doing there. And then there's just, there's a lot of flood repair stuff still underway. We have some exhibits that don't meet standards, um, so we have to kind of address that. But I think a smaller footprint of a zoo, that's been discussed and it I can support a smaller footprint um, that allows people to access some of the park area there without admission fee, but not at the expense of supporting a community asset that includes animals at the zoo. Okay. In closing, uh, Emily, we just have about a minute. Uh, why, oh, should, why should people vote for you? Well, thank you again for meeting. I'm here yeah. to share with you what my vision is and to ask for your support and your endorsement for the primary. Uh, I think people should vote for me because I'm very authentic about what it is that I'm about. And the reality is, if this doesn't move forward, if my vision doesn't move forward, um, on a personal level, I've got a you know I've, I've got a really good life outside of politics. I believe that this vision, though, is one that will benefit Duluth. I believe, I sincerely believe, 
that the momentum that we've seen is important, it is transformational, it is changing the narrative, and I sincerely believe that we have to be very intentional about how we move forward so that we don't leave people behind. What I've seen in other cities when they have um, expanded opportunity and when they have gain strong financial footing and kind of started to change their narrative is you can get growing disparity of who's included in decision making, how people feel, how people are included. This is the time we have to be very intentional. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm certain that everyone who comes in here will say this election is really important. This election is really important. And I believe that. I believe this election is very important. There will be very clear choices between candidates on vision and direction. And um, so I'm here to share with you my vision and ask for your support in the next phase and allow for future discussion on this vision and others. Great. Let me ask one last question, sure. yeah. which I very haven't asked anyone else. Yeah. Other than the streets, the number one complaint I hear from my small group of friends, and it really hasn't changed one iota in 20 years, is is the permitting process? Oh at yeah. City mm -hmm. Hall. Is there is that just the way life is going to be, or is there is there can we make it better? Well, so I'd love to hear more specifically, right, from from you and the group that you work with, or that you so that I can hear exactly where the breakdown is. I hear this consistently. I I'm frustrated too that this continues to be the narrative about the permitting process. I was just meeting with the landlord group yesterday. Um, and so I'm hoping that as we make some more technology advances, you know, and maybe we've talked about technology or maybe you have with other candidates, but the city is adding technology um, to some of the permitting and I'm hoping that makes it easier and clearer. The frustration that I hear, John, from people is I was told one thing and I brought this in and then I had to do another. So what I'd like to see is a um, like a navigator, actually. What I would really like to see is when someone comes in, if you come in, if I come in and I have this, I'm assigned to one person. I'm assigned to Chuck, and it's Chuck's job to tell me exactly how things have to go. And if something goes wrong, I talk with Chuck. You know, so my, my idea within the permitting and building and one-stop shop is that people are assigned a navigator. And I'd like to see that actually in our economic development, too. And, and what I hear is primarily time. It that it takes, takes too much time. It's too much. Oh. It takes forever. You know. Yep. Yeah. And that's frustrating. Mm hmm Yeah. Especially in a short season town. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Very good.